Hi everyone and welcome to episode three of our Hidden London Hangouts. The best thing about this is our advice and information about London's underground system is gimmick free. And I don't do this on my own. First of all, Chris Nix from the London Transport Museum. Hi, Chris. Afternoon, Alex. How are you? What are you wearing? What? <laughs> right, OK. Let's just go around the team and find out what's going on here. Uh, City Holloway. Hi, how are you? Hello. How are you doing? Right, I clearly didn't get the memo. Um, Laura Hilton Brown, how are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you doing? Do you know, you three are looking amazing and I didn't get the memo. So today we're talking about the World, the world War II bunker at Clapham South. Um, and quite clearly, I've got a cast of actors on the team. So from the London Transport Museum, we've got Chris and Siddy and Laura. And me, I'm a professional geek, really, Nosy Parker. And uh, the one who keeps these hens all in control, really. Um, with a couple of hens, sometimes you need a big old cock, and that will be me. So today, here we go with the delights of Clapham South. But before we do that, I think we need a little moment to go through a few bits of admin from the last couple of uh, wonderful Hidden London Hangouts that we've done. First of all, um, we've, we've had a picture in from one of our fans. We've got fans, team. Um, Gary sent a photograph, didn't he? There's Gary, he's in Aldwych Station, and uh, he looks to be, well, he was there sorting through some old signage that was for sale back in, what was it, the 90s, Chris? It was, it was the mid-90s, City, yeah. He, um, he'd come over from Chicago, and uh, that at the time, it seems, is where uh, old signs were being stored and sold. Yeah. Uh, I can't take you seriously so yes, in that beret. I honestly can't take you seriously. <laughs> Uh, Alex, everybody should have a beret in the, in the wardrobe. <laughs> That's amazing. So, hello, Gary. Thank you very much indeed for taking part in our Hidden London Hangouts. And uh, thanks for sending in your photograph. Um, Chris, we've also got um, an apology. An apology from last week's Hidden London Hangout. What on earth did you do wrong? Yeah, it seems I, I was uh, using a fancy expression for rocking a train. Yes. Uh, I... I described it as uh, having a kinetic envelope uh, when it should have been a kinematic envelope, which I'm sure you know is the, the study of uh, things in motion. Uh, and I had literally two people uh, pull me up on, uh, on having, used the, uh, having used the wrong expression. So there we are, the correct term for a train rocking about uh, and the space that it occupies. Uh, is its kinematic envelope. That is brilliant. And if you go back to episode two, we were talking about Charing Cross, and you'll see from one of the photographs in one of our uh, city slideshows that uh, one of the things that Chris has done in his past is rock a tube train with a kinematic envelope. Um, we, we describe those as two hands. That's what we would <laughs> use, but thank you very much indeed for all of that. And, and I just wanted to spend a moment, because this really tickled me when I read this, um, when you um, wonderfully participate, just down below on the YouTube channel and leave your comments, we always read them and some of them really tickle me. So we, we had some lovely comments last time, team. Um, we had some that said things like, when this is all over, when this uh, virus episode is all over, because we're in the middle of um, coronavirus at the moment, can you keep on with these uh, wonderful video casts? And I'd love to. Love to. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Just wish I had the memo about the dress. Um, I miss my Hidden London Charing Cross tour, but looking forward to the next one. Thanks for this episode. My dad worked on the construction of the Fleet Line, says Alison. So uh, she, the Fleet Line was the Jubilee Line. It was like the working title for the Jubilee Line. Um, a second episode, says John J.E. Uh, superb one with four awesome people and great material. This time I watched the, the YouTube channel on my TV and can honestly say it was the best thing on my telly. How cool is that, team? Oh, wow. Amazing feat. Very sweet. I love that we were also talking on the Embankment uh, tour. We're talking about Oswald, the uh, actor, bless him, and uh, the mind, the gap. There's uh, Tim Gowan says that the voice in the elevator at Belsize Park and Chalk Farm is also quite distinctive. A very prim lady. Uh, it's quite a posh area, isn't it, really? I think you kind of have to have a posh voice in a posh area, don't you? And then there was one other um, from PB. Um, he said, um, I wanted just to mention, um, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Um, we were talking about, do you remember the grinder train? <clears throat> Who could forget? 
Yeah, we were talking about the grinder trend that takes away the squeak. And he said, um, PB said, rail corrugations and flange squeal are very big problems. Chris, have you got anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, the secret is to grease the flanges. Um, Good. That, that helps them to uh, slide over the rails and not, not squeal. And there we must leave it. Um, so we're talking about Clapham South today, and uh, it's one of the uh, amazing locations uh, that London Underground has, and we want to know a bit more about it. So um, we're going to go back to the war, and this is probably the reason why Chris and co are all dressed in this most amazing garb. So Chris, just take us back to 1940. So, uh, 1940, uh, the Blitz had begun, nightly bombing every night, uh, London uh, being bombed from the air, uh, and it quickly um, brought the, the city to, uh, you know, a different state. So at the moment, we, we're all used to uh, our, our lockdown and privations, but in the war, um, things were being destroyed across the capital every night and the, the public and government responded to it uh, in, a, in a similar way to how we are now uh, by trying to find ways to, to mitigate it and they created shelters uh, and they sought refuge wherever they could. Now of course people naturally did what they'd done in the First World War which was head for tube stations uh, because they're underground and would give some protection from bombs uh, and explosives raining down from above. Um, but they also uh, created shelters in their back gardens, uh, Anderson shelters, uh, dug into the ground, or created uh, Morrison shelters, uh, which were basically reinforced uh, steel tables with netting on the side, which you would keep on the ground floor of your house, and that might save you from a collapse uh, from the building above. Um, now, those would protect you at most from a, from a, a near miss or your, your house collapsing, um, but a direct hit with something very, very big, a large explosive device, um, you, you'd be extremely fortunate to, uh, to survive that, whatever your shelter in, in the home. And really, um, it, by the, uh, the mid-autumn uh, of 1940, government had realised that it had to create some really proper uh, deep shelters to give civilians better protection. Um, and uh, there was a particularly large bomb which landed in Balham uh, in October of 1940, uh, which, uh, if you've ever seen the film Atonement, um, you'll see it replicated in there. Um, and uh, the bomb blew up the road, blew up the sewer, blew up the water main and blew up the top of the northern line into which all of that liquid slurry flowed uh, and drowned over 60 people in the liquid filth that flowed into the station there. Um, and that, it seems, was the trigger really for government to say, okay, we're going to have to get on and build these things. And within a month, the government have commissioned London Transport to build 10 deep level shelters, each to house about 10,000 people across the north and south of the capital. And that is where Clapham South Deep Level Shelter becomes one of those shelters that the government sets off to build through London Transport. Amazing stuff, thank you. For, and that was done without a script, that's amazing. And um, firstly, <laughs> just, just while we're on you, could you just describe your outfit, please? Um, hot <laughs> is the, uh, the main... <laughs> Kind it's of hot. Word that I was thinking. Do you mean warm? <laughs> it's it's a very heavy woolen uh, jacket on a and a beret on a on a nice warm sunny day here. Um, this is a typical civil defence uh, blouse, I believe it's called, um, <laughs> which uh, would be typical of what air raid precaution or later from 1941 civil defence uh, staff uh, would have worn uh, whilst either acting as wardens, so they might have had that on their shoulder to uh, signify them as a warden, um, to be able to walk around and uh, blow their whistle at people. Uh, but um, the, the civil defence staff also ran uh, the deep shelters and uh, so they would have worn something similar to this. The only difference would have been they had their own unique title on the, on the breast pocket here which have the civil defence, but the new tube shelters over the top. We're not aware that any of those 
survive. Can you give us a two tiny um, whistle, by say, the way? Can you give me a two tiny uh, yes, whistle? I'm also, also just say thank you to my uh, my neighbour Paul who uh, gave me the tip. He used to be in the army and he, he told me how to wear the uh, the beret correctly so there we go. Oh very good <laughs> very very good. Before we go to uh, City to find out how they were built I just mm -hmm. want to talk to Laura because Laura's been down that tube shelter as you guys all have. Laura just give us a bit of a description as to what these shelters looked like because they housed a lot of people didn't they? Do you know what? Clapham's, um, Clapham's a good one because you could be forgiven for walking past it and having no idea what was beneath your feet. Um, it's such a unique kind of hidden space and once you're downstairs and underground, which is 180 steps down, it's a vast, phenomenal, physically overwhelming building. Um, and what we try and do on the tour is bring out all those finer, kind of smaller bits of detail and layer up those stories. So you've got engineering and design and planning. I mean, this place was dug by hand. I mean, I find that totally incredible. Phenomenal. Um, it is. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And then you've got, you've got, with Clapham, you've got the emotion and the experience because you've got people's memories. And we have those memories because we have a lady called Margaret Barford who Chris and Siddy have both interviewed and spent a lot of time with. Absolutely lovely lady. And she's done some oral history for us and she um, is part of the tour and she references jam tarts and remembering playing with her friends and um, eating jam tarts when she was down there. And so we add this into our film clip and I remember once having to order 250 boxes of jam tarts and when the delivery arrived I think they thought I had like a mild obsession with them um, with jam tarts but what we try and do is just just add those little elements of set dressing um, and some some really lovely sound effects as well so when people arrive it's a huge journey for them from the top to the bottom around the tour and back for me it's a really emotional experience and that's why I love clapping and you've got a few little pictures to show us, haven't you, as well? I, I do. What I'm going to do now is give you a really sneaky peek. Um, it's just a really small clip, but I think that it will just give you an idea of, of what the actual bunkers are like when you get down there. That's remarkable and the, th the, the shot that really struck me was the one where the lights come on in that phenomenally long corridor and I suppose this is a good time to bring in City because this is where we actually get a chance to work out how the underground bunkers were built at a time of war ultimately. There's not much about, there's the fear of goodness knows what falling from the sky and down on the ground in London, they're building shelters for phenomenally large numbers of people who are sheltering from the war. City, talk us through the pictures we can see in City's slideshow. Yep, okay, can you see the slideshow now? Yeah, it's amazing. That, that looks like um, a corner in a park. It does, doesn't it? So those who know South London, am I right way round now? You are, you're right yep, up the right yep. way, absolutely. Okay, that's good. So those who know South London might recognise that that is the corner, the very sort of south eastern, I guess, corner of Clapham Common. Uh, and that is the entrance into the deep level shelter at Clapham South. Um, so when you look at it really carefully, you can just see in the distance, the tube station itself. So the bunker is actually underneath the Northern Line, underneath Clapham South Station. Uh, now I'm gonna show you also some historical photographs. So there it is, that's Clapham South. Um, that's shot during the war and it's actually during construction of the actual shelter. And we know that because when you look on the common, you see that giant mount of spoil in the background. Do you see that? That's like four, five, yep. six meters worth of just dirt coming out because they're trying to build this enormous thing right beneath the northern line. And, and just to be clear, this is below the station. So if you think going down the tube is a long way down, this is even further down. Exactly. So, I mean, the remarkable thing about Clapham is that 
the, the fastest way you could build something incredibly deep in London wasn't to try and find an, like an open space and dig really deep there. It was actually to use the space you had already dug in, but just dig even further. And that's why all of these shelters are underneath tube stations. So there's the entrance as it's just being finished. One of the ventilation towers there as well. Now that's what would greet you, those kind of doors, and that's how you would enter into the shelter. Now this is a contemporary photo, as you can imagine, um, but that's the sort of sense that you get. Basically it was split into two, and depending on whether you were staying on the upper or the lower level, you would go uh, to different parts of the shelter. Now that's how deep it actually is. Good grief. So that Look is looking that. up. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So that is looking up about 37 and a half, at least 38 meters. Um, that's how deep the lower level of the shelter is. That's amazing, City. Yeah, so um, when I say upper or lower level, what I mean is that the shelter is essentially a big railway tunnel. So it's a 16 foot, uh, 16 foot six, I think. 16 foot six um, railway tunnel, which means it's big enough to hold full size uh, trains, not just small, smaller tube trains. Um, and they're essentially two big tunnels that are parallel to one another and they're split into half. So you see it says top story and bottom story. And that's what the, the shelter consisted of. So if I do that, it kind of gives you a sense of, of what the shelter actually looked like. Now, funnily enough, this is the shot in one of the cross passages. So Chris, do you want to explain what we're looking at? Yeah, so the construction of these things was done in a terrible rush, really, but was very elegantly thought through. Um, once London Transport were given the job in uh, November 1940, they had six weeks before they were actually building these by January 1941. And the only way they could do this so quickly was to use stock parts that they already had. And they had tunnel lining ring parts from all of the previous underground railway projects uh, from the decades before. But that created a challenge um, was to how to use those parts that weren't necessarily designed to work together to create this shelter. Imagine it's the, it's the anniversary of uh, Apollo uh, 13 just gone. And that, that scene where they dumped the, uh, the air parts on the, on the table and I have to work out how to make the filters fit in the wrong sized hole. It must have been a bit like that. And this tunnel, um, the engineers had to work out how to use some running tunnel parts for uh, the typical 12 foot 6 uh, deep tube lines fit with those big 16 foot 6 mainline sized uh, ones that City referred to which form the rest of the shelter. Mm -hmm. And the way they did it was creating a figure of eight tunnel. It's very, very unusual to see something like this. We've had, we've had tunnel engineers come round here uh, just to have a look at uh, uh, a figure of eight tunnel, uh, as there aren't many out there in the wild. Yeah. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. And, and to think that all of this was made up out of bits and bobs, you know, really, that were just lying yeah. around. What's this, Sun City? So this is the overview of the entire site. So just to give people a sense of the scale, uh, each tunnel is 411 meters long. That is divided by two, which in total means that it's about 1644 meters, meaning that it's over a mile of tunnel all put together. And that's not including all of the extra rooms that you have off to the side, including the toilets and some of, uh, some of the um, the, the superintendent's offices. So it's an enormous site. And I mean, I can probably speak for all of us when I say when we've gone down there, it's just, you know, particularly the first few times we ever went, it's just, you can't believe something like that was built so quickly. And as Laura mentioned earlier, by hand. So here you can see they've, they've all been sort of basically color coded and they've also been named in different ways. Now, this has kind of given you a sense of what it is, sort of 3D sense of what the, the shelter is. And this is from something we did last year. We basically got the entire site um, 3D scanned to give us a, sort of people a sense of how big it really is. Um, but that's kind of- I mean, just look at it for goodness sake. That's incredible. And how many people could be housed in there at any one time? So the 
shelter was built to house 8,000 people. Originally, there was supposed to be 10 deep shelters, all to house 10,000 people. So it would have been just a, a number that, that somebody in the government would have thrown at it, you know, so yes. 10 shelters, 10,000 people, something just to get the, the ball rolling. However, 10,000 people together in, in a very confined space is a lot. Now there you can see some of the shelter names. But how do they get those? Well, the shelters were all uh, alphabetical, so it would help people find their way once they got into this enormous structure. Um, so you can see it's A, B, C, D, but each shelter was given a kind of different theme in order to, for people to kind of remember it better and also to differentiate between each site. So Clapham South has got a nautical theme. Uh, all of those people are either uh, admirals, vice admirals, and we've even got a uh, naval engineer within the mix. Drake, Ooh. look at that, amazing. Oh, look, there they are, they're sleeping, and then there's, and they're the bunks, are they? Yeah, so these are the bunks. That lady there is fumigating the site. So that's something that's also quite interesting. Once, you, or once you're trying to house 8,000 people in a very confined space, you've got to really think about things like sanitation and um, policing people, you know, like how are you going to make sure everyone gets along and how are you going to make sure that people aren't, you know, behaving as they should. Um, and also how are you going to clean the place? So people had to be out every single morning at 7 a.m. So ladies like that could come around and clean the entire site. Imagine cleaning a mile of tunnel every single day. Um, it's pretty incredible. I mean, yeah. Incredible. Now, there they are. And there sleeping. they are. Um, and just, you know, you get a sense of the community feel even there. And, you know, the people we've spoken to, such as Margaret, really loved being there, you know, because the shelters didn't actually open until 1944 to the public. They were finished in 1942, but there was a, a bit of a lull. Well, I wouldn't say lull. There was a bit of a break in, um, in bombardment of London at the time. So... Uh, so they weren't used for, the, for civilians until 1944. And just imagine you've been at war for five years already and then finally getting a safe place to sleep at night would have been an enormous relief. And the camaraderie um, as well, City. You know, the, the, the fact that you must have felt so alone. You know, we're in the middle of a, a very strange crisis around the world at the moment where people feel very isolated in their homes. Suddenly oh. you can go somewhere and, and you're permitted to be with other people and chat and socialize and sing and just have a life down there. It, uh, but I mean, look at that picture there. It's, it's epic. It's yeah. absolutely epic. Well, that's the thing. That's what, I think that's what strikes everyone when they first come down there. And, and, you know, as Laura was saying, like, it's so kind of massive and, and it's, a, it's emotional almost because, you know, all of these senses, we've talked about this on, on, on past shows but when people have asked me in the in the past whether I feel uncomfortable or scared down there the answer is always no you know it's built to protect people it feels very homey very cozy it feels like it's there to kind of make sure that you're safe not that you're um, in any kind of danger and there, and there it is yeah. and that is the 16 foot 6 the diagram across the shelter there you go. thank you Siddy bless you thank you're you welcome. very much Chris, you mentioned earlier about the numbers of people who were actually basically allowed to be in these places in 10 uh, locations. Um, where were those locations around London, Chris? Well, they started work at 10 locations and they, they abandoned two of them partway through the build. So they only finished eight. But if you start in the north, uh, you begin at Belsize <coughs> Park, then Camden Town. Uh, Good Street, uh, Chancery Lane and St Paul's. St Paul's was abandoned. Uh, then coming south, Oval, which was abandoned. Stockwell, Clapham North, Clapham Common and Clapham South. Clapham got its fair share of deep shelters. And actually the Northern Line got its more than its fair share of shelters because with the exception of a couple on the Central Line, they were all on the Northern Line, weren't they? Is that because of the depth of the line? Well, it, it's it's partly that it, it's um, it, it dates to um, a, a plan before the war to create uh, express tube lines. There was a, a no, had to be a notional idea at least that these things might be used after the war, and there had been pre-existing plan for express Northern Central and Bakerloo lines uh, deeper, it's effectively the forerunners to parts of Crossrail One and Two, uh, th those alignments. 
and uh, that's that's why the tunnels were built as big as they were. Um, and uh, so they, when they were then looking for locations to build these, well, it helped to keep them on the tube because it meant that people could travel from elsewhere in London to get to them. Um, and it just so happened that Northern Line and the Central Line were the ones that were chosen as the best locations. They they were able to do that because they already had the way leave, i.e., the, the the permission to be able to build underneath uh the existing tube lines and then they also needed sites uh to build the entrances to these uh these bunkers and so uh these shelters rather and so uh they needed places where there was a bomb site really and a building had already gone so they could build the entrances into them and uh, the final thing is all of the shelters were originally built for connection onto their host station so they had an emergency entrance and exit uh, now those have been sealed up subsequently, so don't go looking for them, but uh, they uh, they used to connect on so that they had two main entrances and then a third emergency one in the station. I love the idea of having an express northern line though. I love the idea of that. It's strange and shame that it never really happened. I've got actually, I've got something to show you guys because um, normally it's uh, you show me something, but this is something that, this is a picture that I bought years ago. I don't know whether you can see this, but this is actually I think it's taken at the Bakerloo uh -huh. Line Depot, and it's actually mid-war, and it's women washing down the tube trains. And I love this picture, and it, to me it's symbolic of what life was like in, in the war. Everybody was mucking in doing jobs that they perhaps were not ordinarily going to do. And I just love the fact that this was just a, a period in time where there were no rules. Everything just kind of changed, and um, and so it, it sort of fascinated me. And Chris, there were also quite a lot of rules of occupancy of these uh, shelters, weren't there? There were. There were things like you weren't allowed pets. Um, you had to be in and out at certain times of the day. Um, but there were they. The main thing about keeping order was actually about keeping morale up. Um, not just you know wagging the finger and uh, you know having people in uniform coming around and being authoritative. Um, they would recruit volunteer wardens from the shelters uh, to look after sections and to report any problems or let the let the shelter wardens know if anything was uh, needed by their friends and family. That was quite a clever way of getting people to take responsibility for their friends and family. Um, uh, and so it, it was more about um keeping morale up and keeping people happy than than just ruling with a with a rod of iron and what about the conditions down there city because i can imagine that um with so many people in close proximity although it's probably great for community i wouldn't imagine it was that great for i don't know just feeling like you had personal space or cleanliness or what was it like down there um it's a good question i mean can you see me by the way mm. Yeah, look at all day. Um, no, I mean, I think it, by our modern day standards, the conditions would have been rather challenging. Um, I think, you know, the toilet situation was far from ideal. They had so, so, something called an LSAN toilet, a chemical toilet in each, each of, the, um, of the toilet stores, which basically was a bucket with a bit of disinfectant at the bottom and you had to pour the bucket into a bit of a kind of a thing called a hopper and, and that's how you got rid of waste. So I'm imagining that wasn't particularly uh, appealing to most. Um, I mean, I've been on holidays like that. That's pretty yeah. grim, isn't it, really? <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, you know, you think about the times that you've been on a port or something, just kind of, that's, that's the feel that we're going mm. for. Um, you know, let's, I won't, won't go further into detail on that one. Um, <laughs> I think well, also, you know, being uh, crammed into a room with 500 of your closest friends and neighbours, uh, you know, snoring and shouting and smoking, of course, people were still allowed to smoke down there. Um, it must have been like a fog down there, mustn't it? I mean, really, I mean, evocative as, as we, you know, in the 21st century, we can go down there and say, wow, imagine that. But I should, I think at the time, it probably wasn't that pleasant a place to be, really. Last yeah. resort. 
Well, this is the thing though, like that's what we've always assumed. Um, the thing is about the, the cigarette smoke and, and the air quality was actually very high because they had these huge fans power, powering basically kind of a pull and push system of air being moved around the entire, entire um, shelter. So it was actually kind of cool down there and not that oppressing, uh, according to the people that we've, we've spoken to who lived down there. Um, but I think, as I said before, uh, you know, it would probably have been just such a welcome respite from whatever else you would have on the, on the surface, you know. And the drama and the fear of, um, up on ground level, you know, who yeah. knows what's gonna happen that night. It must've been phenomenal. And even after the war, I mean, the, the, the thing that fascinates me is even immediately after the war, um, I suppose you might be forgiven for thinking they just shut down immediately, but people had been displaced. They had no homes of their own and they continued to be a home for people right up through 1946 and a bit beyond, didn't they? Yeah, they did. In, in, in fact, and actually as a part of some of uh, my second slideshow, I'll show you a bit of, uh, of some evidence of that. Um, we had some people from, well, basically using the shelter all of the, up until they were deemed to be uninhabitable in 1956. So essentially providing shelter for much more than just war refugees, so to speak, but to mm. anyone who needed sort of a shelter in London. Incredible. And while you get that secret slideshow ready, because we've always, we're loving this, by the way, and the, the feedback that we get from the people who are watching this, they love the photograph. So Siddy, you get yourself ready for the secret slideshow part two. Uh, Chris, just do me a favour, because these buildings are still down there. What are they used for today? Well, um, after the war, uh, after people finished living in them, um, government had to find uh, a new use for them. Um, didn't want to leave them derelict, you still have to pay to look after them. And so uh, what they did was start using them to store things. Um, and so they were originally built with two small service lifts as well, each of these sites. So uh, they stored government archive, I believe a public records office stored some of its records there. They were offered to some of the big national museums as well for stores, but actually they, they became commercial uh, archives. Uh, now that's something which in the last decade or so, um, uh, big commercial archives have started to move out of them and build sort of out of town ones. Um, but there are still a few of them that are used for, um, for storing commercial archive. Um, however, the one that's the neighbour to ours at Clapham South, um, the one at Clapham Common, is used for something ingenious, which is to grow microherbs. So if you eat microherbs in London, or if you go to uh, some of the uh, larger supermarkets, which are also sell them, a company called Growing Underground, bonus points for the title. Ah, oh, very good, uh, very good. Um, grow um, these beautifully sweet herbs under LED light and hydroponic conditions uh, in Clapham Common. I love it. See, they even have a use now, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Siddy, let's have a look at some more photographs because this is, oh man, look at this. So here we have something very interesting. Um, once we started clearing out the shelter, so we, we have the shelter at Clapham South where the tenants on the site and we intend to kind of be the custodians of the site for, for many years to come. Um, and you really can't imagine how much history is actually written on the walls in that shelter. And so we did a big project where uh, I essentially walked the entire site and marked out every single graffiti or, or marking on the wall to, um, for us to, to kind of document and hopefully one day, you know, try to map out some of these people. So here you see Susan M. Allen was there on May 17th, 1952. Uh, and from the, what's it say, Porchester Methodist Youth Club. Amazing. Amazing. Now, this, I thought oh, I would look. Uh, just throw over to Laura, actually. So this is from when we started doing some film screenings down in Clapham, just to diversify and do something different. Uh, Laura, do you remember that first day that we did that? I do, absolutely. Actually, gives me a little bit of goosebumps now I'm looking at the picture again. Um, it's a kind of nod as well as to why we're dressed as we are today because 
I know back in episode one, we talked about Aldwych and we did a quite immersive theatrical piece and had actors leading, leading that event. And what we'd love to do at Clapham, should the building um, kind of ever allow us to, is do something a little bit more kind of immersive and theatrical. Um, the museum are really good uh, with the Depot Open weekends and the vintage um, vehicle rides that we do, that people, you know, a lot of the audience love getting dressed up and getting involved. And if we could do that at Clapham, I think that would make us, um, make us all very happy. But the, the tours themselves are fantastic. There's, there's a lot of narrative, obviously, Chris and City have spoken about how it's, you know, not just the sheltering, there's Empire Windrush and the Festival of Britain, a kind of Penny Hotel there as well. So all of these stories just layering up. And what we thought we'd do is um, an event where it was a, a kind of mini tour and a bit of a film clip. And we set dressed um, to uh, just make it a little bit more atmospheric um, and so that people you know, really felt a bit more immersed in what it would have felt and looked like when they were down there. So cities pop those those pictures in there. And um, yeah, that was, we really enjoyed that event. It was lovely yeah. to put on. Looks amazing, looks amazing. I know. And um, one of the things that we've sort of talked about in the future is if we could do some sort of like, I don't know, immersive theater or something, like a shelter experience, something that we, we're keen to work on. We're sort of always spitballing around. Um, just if anyone was wondering, whether the bunks are comfortable, I can tell you that they are. <laughs> oh, look at look at City. Look That's at City there. Well done. Well. And then That's she went home to very her hard flats. work doing some filming back last year when we were preparing for the Hidden London exhibition. Um, I believe photo credit goes to Chris Nix on this one. Um, they're very comfortable and you get very tired sometimes working I down love on that. the ground. Chris now, Nix, our very own Sid was, James. Uh, now that is growing up. <laughs> it was the most Sorry, Chris, what was that? I was going to say, that was the most relaxing meeting uh, we, we've ever had <laughs> in, in the bunks, uh, <laughs> discussing elements of the Hidden London exhibition. Taking he said that. was a bit hard. The, the yeah, he said that until he recorded a hangout with me. Uh, <laughs> what's this in, Sidney? Is this your hydroponics? This is the hydroponics. So um, this is from when Laura and I went down there with a photographer back in 2018 to do some photography through the Hidden London book. Um, so it's really weird because all of these shelters were built to a similar design, a little bit different each one of them, but a very similar one. So when you come down into each one of them, obviously Clapham is our one and our baby. And so when we come down, we're sort of like, hmm, this is a bit like mine. I'm, sort of you kind of recognize it but you don't um we got to taste some of their micro herbs nice who are confused about micro herbs as i was it's basically tiny tiny salad um, <laughs> tiny basil tiny basil tiny salad um, <laughs> really tasty salad uh, really adds great flavor to the dishes of course nice um, but that was really fun. And also because it, they have to light it in su such a peculiar way, it really feels like some kind of, again, sci-fi area that you're going into. It's really, it's really it looks cool. looks like a great club. It could be a brilliant <laughs> club. And that is the, that's the one. That is the shot. That's 400 meters long, that, isn't it? Uh, that, well, that's, that's one sub shelter. So it'll be 100 meters. 100 meters. It is phenomenal i mean chris that is quite a sight to behold isn't it it is th this was a photo that i took uh, on my last visit there actually before uh, before uh, lockdown began um we just finished uh relighting uh that that shelter with the original bulkhead lights it's the only one in the site where the original lights survive in sufficient number that we could reinstate them and our electrician Martin had just finished uh, and um, put them back to how they were, which is the right colour temperature and dimmable and it's incredibly atmospheric. We would just finished stripping out all the fluorescent lighting, which is what's in the cart. Um, I love, the, I love the fact you even like the colour temperature of the bulbs, Chris. I mean, this is a real <laughs> level of attention to detail. <laughs> I bet your wife loves you for your colour temperature bulbs. You, you can't get the wrong colour temperature, it just looks <laughs> all wrong. It's awesome. Oh Thank you, guys. <laughs> that is an amazing set of photographs. And of course, that one, if you follow any of us on Instagram, you will have all seen that photograph. And I think Chris is actually quite proud of that, aren't you, Chris? 
I am. That that was um, this time last year when we were doing the 3D scan of the site, uh, and that was one of the brand new uh, Leica scanners, which had just arrived in the country and did its uh, first job scanning uh, like 40 billion data points, I think, to capture the uh, the huge site there. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Team, thank you so much for that gallop around um, Clapham South. What beautiful, beautiful building and what amazing history actually. And um, aren't we lucky as a city to have something like that that actually remains? It's, uh, it's brilliant. So Laura, Siddy and Chris, thank you very much. Uh, we've got some questions. Every uh, episode of the Hidden London Hangout that we host, we uh, answer your questions as well. We love receiving them. Just below, Make sure that you comment as the shows are broadcast on YouTube. Make sure that you leave us your comments and questions. And then in subsequent issues, we'll make sure that we get answers for you. You've got a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is from somebody who is, I believe the, the word is mononymous. Mononymous. He's actually got a number in his name and it's legal. His name is Nick and his, it's written as N1CK. And apparently it's legal, I checked. Um, and his question is, what is the oldest moquette? Moquette is the fabric that you sit on, on buses and trains. And what are our favourites? So they were the questions. Chris, what's your favourite moquette? Um, the one that I'm actually sat on at the moment uh, is a cushion <laughs> behind my chair, um, which you showed the 38 stock earlier. And uh, this is a fabric um, known by two, two names, uh, Leaf or Collendale. Uh, and that would have been on oh, the 38 oh. stock. Um, it's by an artist called Marion Dawn. Um, just beautiful, beautiful maquette in my view. I love, the, I love the idea that, I mean, I'm pushing and pushing and pushing to have a whole hidden London hangout about maquette because I think that as soon as people see it and they start touching it, cats love it, by the way, they just devour <laughs> it, tear it to bits. Um, but I think there is such a rich history in this. It's such a durable fabric. And I've got it all over, around my house as well. I've got, for instance, in this seat here behind me, I've got this one, which a lot of people will recognize as a tube fabric that they sit on now on tube trains. I love this because you flip it over and it suddenly becomes the Victoria line. I believe that's right, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Old and, uh, yeah. 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 And then, of course, I've got a bit of the new Victoria line here, okay. which is beautiful. Cat's not got hold of that yet. And um, and I've got these a couple of these, which my lovely friend Marion made. And I can't remember where this fabric comes from. I thought it was on the old tube stock, but I may be wrong. What do you reckon, Chris? We, yeah, we have that um, on the thirty-eight stock. It's a later one that was used on the thirty-eight stock. Green, um, there's, there's quite a lot of green and red maquettes um, in the, the tube's history. Green was sort of seen as quite a restful colour and symbolic of the countryside. Uh, and of course, its complementary colour is red. So um, that's why you get a lot of green and red. You get a load patterns. of that. I love it. And also, yeah. just to show that I I'm a complete dweeb when it comes to this kind of thing, I even framed segments. <laughs> and I've got that one. <laughs> And I also have this one, which hangs on my wall. And these, and you may notice some of these, you may recognize a few of these. Um, so you can Alex. imagine that I've gone crazy for Moquette in my time. Alex, uh, I thought I had a problem. <laughs> oh, I've got many problems, trust me. Um, my shrink goes to town with me regularly. Um, if you want to see more pictures of those, uh, they're on all of our um, social media, on our Instagrams. I'm Alex Grundon. Uh, we've got Chris Nix, and we've also got City Holloway. You can find them as well. And don't forget the at LT Museum. Instagram page as well, which is fantastic. There's so many bits and bobs on there. Uh, they're running alphabets at the moment. It's really, really lovely. And don't forget to follow us and subscribe here as well on YouTube. Um, also, um, the question was, what is the oldest moquette? Um, lozenge was, some, was, was suggested by somebody. Is that right, Chris, do you think? Lozenge is quite old. It's, um, it's a 20s one. Um, there's one that's possibly a contender, a uh, B-type uh, maquette, which I, I, haven't, I, I have got a sample somewhere. I'll see if I can dig it out for, for next week. Um, but we recreated B-type uh, when we restored Battle Bus, uh, which is our 
uh, P9 bus that we've put back into First World War troop carrying condition. Um, so yeah, I've got a, I've got a sample of that somewhere, which I'll uh, I'll dig out for next time. Lozenge is actually uh, quite a, a beautiful one as well. Um, some people call that red and green one that you you've just held up lozenge as well. Original lozenge was uh, used on both bus and tube, uh, and is more of a um, it's a kind of a teal and beige one. I'll uh, I'll dig nice. it out for next time. Lovely. Um, Alex, question number Alex. two. Oh, yes, yes, Laura. Oh, sorry, Laura. Yes. No, no, What's no, 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 no. Fine. Just grab your cushion, your uh, barman moquette cushion from behind you. So that just happens to be my favourite moquette. But did you know there are four hidden London landmarks in that? Really? Okay, so let's yeah. have a quick look at this. I need to do this the right Turn way it. up. I think it's that way up, isn't it? Is that the yeah. right way up? Yeah. yeah. So we have, um, we have um, the London Eye. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I presume we have the Shard. Is Big Ben. No. Go on then. Oh, go on. So, please put me out of my misery. I think it's St Paul's, right? Um, yeah, it's Big yeah. Ben. So. And two columns of Tower Bridge, and they're either end of the cushion, and then you can kind of, I guess, visually try and put the bridge in between. Oh. I love it. I love it. You see, this is proper design. This is what we love about the London. Right. It's see, that's a good one. Coolness. I love it. I love it. Thank you very much. And Sidi, you're not you're not so much of a moquette fan, are you? I, I haven't gotten into it yet, I have to admit. Um, you know, there have been many attempts to convert me. I've been partially converted by Chris over the years. Um, I do love one which is called Fossil, which is on an old 1899 bogey car that we have in the museum. Uh, uh, here we go. One. Oh, I love this. Yeah. I love this. Found it. There you are. Oh, there you go. So awesome. I really like that one. <laughs> that's beautiful. I'm just recovering a seat in it. <laughs> I love that. It'd be like, for Christmas, I'm going to use one of my offcuts and I'm going to make you a buffet. It's going to be great. I love it. I love it. <laughs> question number two from Emma. This is now, this is quite a cool question, this one. Why are Covent Garden and Leicester Square stations so close together? Chris and I were talking about this actually uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. And it's interesting that you mentioned the Piccadilly line because on the Piccadilly line, especially in the central section of London, there are a number of disused stations on the Piccadilly. Um, and the, your question actually pertains to why they're disused. Is that not right, Chris? Yeah, um, Piccadilly line, it was, it was an early tube line. Uh, it was built when it was private railway companies building them and trying to put their stations in places that would get them lots of passengers using uh, their line. And in some places they did go a little crazy and build a few too many stations. And then as the line extended, found it rather difficult to run trains to, to time with so many stops uh, in, in the centre of town. So the Piccadilly line originally ran from uh, Finsbury Park to Hammersmith, but then of course was extended out Heathrow uh, and Foster's. Now, um, that there came a, a lot of closures in the centre of uh, centre of uh, town, which gives us quite a few of our our stations that are hidden London tours. So Down Street closed 1932, uh, Brompton Road as well, York Road, and actually Covent Garden was was scheduled uh, has been scheduled for closure and in its life as well. Um, simply because it didn't have uh, sufficient people using it. Uh, we're very glad that obviously it didn't close because it's the one that carries people to London Transport Museum. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, quite a few of those uh, stations that didn't and have And basically they, they put closed. a station wherever they dug a hole to get rid of the dirt, didn't they? So that's yeah. effectively why there are so many so close together because they were just excavating large amounts of muck from underneath London. And so they put one at Covent Garden and one at Leicester Square. And hilariously, when you then look at what effect that had on running a railway, it just meant there were too many stops and the trains just were taking too long to get through London. So they shut a few stations. It's fascinating, felt like a waste, I think, to anyone who doesn't really understand. But when you look at it from that perspective, I suppose it all makes a bit more sense. And we've got question three from John on Instagram. Uh, he says, Brompton Road Station, we were talking about these um, stations which were closed, Brompton Road mm -hmm. being one of them on the Piccadilly line that shuts. What's the history there? And Sidney and Chris, this 
actually possibly pertains to what we're going to talk about next week on the Hidden London Hangout, doesn't it? Yeah, so Brompton Road's a fascinating station. It lies between Knightsbridge and South Kensington. Uh, I mean, the, the clue's in the name, right? Brompton Road, so you get, get a sense of where that is. Uh, it, it Again, it was very little used. Uh, it kind of didn't serve uh, anywhere as much as, as South Kensington and Knightsbridge did. Um, and when they were speeding up the Piccadilly line, they decided, look, let's also get rid of, of Brompton Road. And so 1934, Brompton Road station closed. Um, however, it was later leased over to the, um, uh, the what's it called, the Air Aid Precaution of London, and it was converted into a control center for ARP in London. Um, and that's why it's got quite a big significance in terms of the Second World War and who occupied the station uh, during that time. So maybe Chris can elaborate. I think it's a, it's a topic for a, um, a, a future uh, hangout, in fact. It's a very big subject to, uh, to tackle. Um, Brompton Road serves as a, um, a little bit of a prototype for some of the things that are built at Down Street, uh, and they are effectively bunkers. Um, and we'll unpack Down Street's story properly in our next episode. Uh, and I'm sporting the mug ahead of uh, ahead of time. I'm glad the system we use actually doesn't allow me to be in vision all the time because whenever you're in shock, Chris, with your beret, I've got this <laughs> chuckle in my fa on my face. It is a little bit kind of embarrassing, really. I think you look great, well, guys. You look. It was his idea brilliant. to dress up. He just wanted to wear that suit. <laughs> <laughs> just, he's such a prima donna, isn't he? I love it. Oh, Nick's, honestly. Our, our tours, our little secret tours around tube stations are going to be so different from now, honestly. I just need to go, maybe like one of the, um, you know, I don't know, YMCA, maybe I could turn up as the builder or something like that. It could be great fun, couldn't it? Yeah, I um, think so. I think we could do this. Um, team, thank you so much, as always, for another awesome Hidden London Hangout. Um, I've learned so much and um, a fascinating evocative moment looking back at um, uh, the, the war in London and how it affected uh, transport and how um, London was given these places of safety in amongst all the carnage. So Laura, thank you so much as always. Absolute pleasure. I, I love talking about Clapham and um, I hope that this has give, kind of given people a little bit of um, an insight into um, just how hidden and vast and emotional that venue is. It's, it's interesting, my, na my late nan and granddad used to go to the Camden Town Shelter and so talking about it is a little bit of a link back to them which is always very sweet. Siddy, yeah. thank you so much as well. Are both of you girls looking absolutely gorgeous as always, thank you. <laughs> Siddy, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I think the two hours of hair and makeup was definitely <laughs> worth it. Uh, yeah. Chris has put on a beret and we have to be here, you know, putting putting our hair in, in just the right place but uh, it's always fun to dress up and I hope we get to do way more dress up with Clapham South with the public once all of this is over. Yeah, no, I, it took me about two hours to dress up to look like this as well. Um, which is a bit of a <laughs> terrible shame, really. Gorgeous. An indictment, an indictment on my looks. And Chris, I, I mean, although I've, I've joked and smiled all the way through this, <laughs> you do look spectacular. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. And I, I found a little book which I thought might be useful for you in these times. Uh, <laughs> personal. <laughs> Personal protection <laughs> against gas. Um, I'll, I'll pop it in the post. Do, you. do, absolutely. As you can see, my face has gone slightly red. I'm not quite sure what anyone can smell in this room at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, so next week, uh, we're going to Down Street. Uh, we've had the public shelters. Down Street had a very, very different use. Command and control, the place where everything was going on. We'll find out about that. So don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Down below, just down there, Leave your comments and your compliments if you want to, and your suggestions. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Follow at LT Museum on Instagram. Feel free to follow us as well. There's loads of bits and bobs that we post up there as well. This time next week, we're in Downstream. Have yourself a great day and stay safe.